this is of course this is the fall and uh, man you could you could just teach and teach and teach and teach on this fall because really everything basically that we're dealing with in the world is because of this fall yeah. right. and so the whole deal is in this fall okay. it's just a matter it's amazing how much you can bring out of it and I'm really just going to touch on it okay Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 through 10 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him where art thou and he said, I heard thy, thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. The title of this message is Guilt and Shame. Maybe see it. Um, I got a lot, a lot of the info I got uh, was from uh, Brother Walter and sent me a video of... Uh, uh, that dude, R.C. Sproul. And then I, I had been watching um, online, I've been watching uh, Bishop C.M. Wright, and uh, he's just got a, a wealth of information on his website, and I've just been soaking it up. <laughs> I mean, basically, um, part, of, part of this subject, he got 12 hours of teaching on, on this, just, just on shame alone, 12 hours. And I've watched all 12 hours and I've taken notes. I really feel like this is, this is my destiny. This is my, God's will for me is to, is to really open up this thing on shame. Now, not today because you're talking about 12 hours of teaching. There's no way I can hit any of that. But I'm just going to touch on it today. But I do plan on, I believe that God has put it on my heart. Because this, this is a, a major issue. Okay. I want to go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 25. And they were both naked, and the, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This was before what we just read. This was the last chapter right before what we just read. They were both naked, the man and his wife were not ashamed. We see from the text that before their transgression, guilt, shame, and fear were not part of their life. I believe it's important, important that we get insight into these cancers to, get, and to gain insight of our adversary. Yes. The more you know about your enemies, the more you will be prepared for battle. Guilt, shame, and fear were intertwined here. And, they, and when they sinned in the garden, this interwoven paradox becomes a blockade to faith and God's love. They hid themselves from God because of shame and the fear and dread that shame instituted. Fear of shame is the main reason most people and backsliders avoid church. Um, they, though they may come up with many excuses. They may come up with a bunch of excuses. But it really, most of the time, it's going to boil down to fear and shame and that's the reason why they won't. But shame is, is, is the major reason, Brother Wright teaches, for backsliding. Shame is the major reason. And I'm a, I may get into that. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm a, this is a dictionary definition of shame. It's actually two, two different ones. Okay, A painful emotion caused by a strong sense of guilt, embarrassment, disgrace, unworthiness, or disrespect. And the second definition is exposure of one's weaknesses, graceful conduct, action, or sin. They hid themselves. God did not reject or abandon them. He sought after them. Otherwise, He would not have called to them as in verse 9. 
verse 9, he says, um, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? So he called unto them. So God was not, you know, he wasn't uh, stressed about the, the, the guilt, the shame, and the fear. He wasn't stressed over that. Um, it was the fear of painful exposure that caused them to hide. While our feelings are real, they often don't reflect reality and bring about a false perception. That's what they did. They brought about a false perception, perception of reality. Guilt and shame are not the same debilities. Guilt is the effect of the violated conscience as in a guilty conscious. The voice of guilt says, I have done wrong. The voice of shame says, I am wrong. Guilt says, I have failed. Shame says, I am a failure. Um, guilt says, I messed up. Shame says, I'm a mess. You see, you see that because the, the shame is, is, is inward. The correct response to guilt is, one, contrition, godly sorrow for sin, two, confession, not making excuse or blame, shift the blame as Adam and Eve did, and three, repentance, seek forgiveness and turn from sin to God. That's the answer to uh, guilt. Shame has to be forgiven because the root of shame is a grudge or judgment against ourselves. Condemnation of self brings, which brings a feeling of unworthiness. One symptom is asking God forgiveness for forgiveness of the same sin more and more than once because I don't feel forgiven. That's a symptom right there that you, you haven't forgiven yourself. Because all you have to do is ask forgiveness one time and God hears that one time. Okay. There are many other symptoms and this uh, and this order is attributed attributed to shame. Like I said, I, I've been through twelve hours of it, and I can. Uh, and I'm telling you what I, th I wrote. I got like eight pages of notes, full pages of notes, and uh, it's just amazing how how deep it goes. But um, failure and rejection are key elements of shame. People and even saints who have a significant amount of guilt and shame tend to project these two onto others in their daily interactions. If we don't forgive ourselves, we will be judgmental toward others and find it difficult to forgive others. And we will not be long-suffering but critical with them. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm moving on to uh, my next uh, subtitle, which is narcissism. Narcissism is a uh, is really a, a deep a deep form of uh, guilt and shame. It's, uh narcissism basically has about seven attributes to it, but everybody, just about everybody, has one or a few of those attributes even if you're not a narcissist you're going to have a part because we all pretty much deal with shame and uh, and I had a lot of shame which uh, I don't want to go into all that but um, all right I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to do the definition of narcissism a psychological condition characterized by self preoccupation lack of empathy and unconscious deficit unconscious deficit in self-esteem that means the narcissists do not realize that they don't have self-esteem they don't realize it it's unconscious and they don't uh, they don't realize they don't have empathy does everybody know what empathy is yeah empathy is where you know I empathize with you I can I know your feelings I can share your feelings I can feel share things with you but a narcissist is oblivious to other people's feelings 
they're oblivious to them. And so they're, they're so wrapped up into themselves, you know, that they, they, they're just not, not conscious of those. And they'll treat you like a piece of dirt, but they won't even think about it. Treat you like a piece of dirt. Okay. Do you know anyone who attempts to place guilt trips on you or others? Those with a lot of guilt and shame learn to be expert shamers. That means they can, without even thinking about it, they can shame you expertly. I know. <laughs> Believe me, I've worked in the prison for 14 years and I've, I've dealt with some expert shamers. Uh, these are the kind of people that are hard to be around, especially if you can't, if you can easily be easily offended. They often use shame as a tool to control and to manipulate, though often they are not aware they are doing this. This type of person has all has an almost impossible time forgiving others because of unforgiveness against self. They are very critical of everyone and tend to micromanage whenever they're in leadership positions, they're gonna micromanage you. Um, guilt and shame are the roots of this personality. Actually, these are the basics of all sin as seen in the scripture. We see when we're reading in Genesis the fall, that right there in that in that scriptures of the fall is the basics of all sin in the world is in that scripture. Satan hasn't changed his methods. He's just improved on them. He's, he's now using technology to advance his works. Uh, that's what, like with this social media, he's just, he, he's having a blast, Satan is, because he's just, he's bringing all this shame and he's all, all this, uh, the, the porn is, is one of the worst because the, the pornography, all right, the industry is making so much money. That's the reason why they won't outlaw it. It needs to be outlawed. But it's making so much money. It's making more money than any, it's making more money than the sports. You know, how much are those sports players making? They're making, uh, you know, millions, right? But the pornography industry is making more than that. It's making more than the pharmaceuticals. And yeah, and you're talking about billions. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? Okay, so that's why they won't outlaw it. Although they need to. Okay, let me let me move on. <laughs> let me move on. Okay. Um, I can name a bunch of narcissists in the Bible, but I'm just going to name one. Is everybody familiar with King Saul, the first king of Israel? Okay, he was a narcissist. That's the reason why, you know, he wouldn't obey God. He always was interested in his self, his self-image and everything. It was just he was totally consumed with himself, and he wouldn't obey God. Even when God said, "You're not going to be king anymore," he sought he he when he sought after David to kill David, so that David wouldn't be the king. <laughs> Serious narcissist. Okay, and then I can just go on and on, but I'm not going to go on with that. Um, my next topic subtopic is nakedness. Okay, we he, they mentioned nakedness in the scriptures. Okay. There are basically three types of nakedness we experience. The King James Bible uses the same English word for each one, but the Hebrew words are different because the meaning is different. Okay? There are other nuances of nakedness in the scripture also, but I'm just going to focus on the main three. The first one is Strong 6174, and it refers to an innocent type of nakedness. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. That's the kind of naked, it's an innocent kind of nakedness where you can be naked and not be ashamed, like a small child. Okay, the second one is the second one is nakedness with the despair of shame, which was what we first read, which was is Strong's fifty nine oh three, uh, Genesis three ten, and he said, "I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself." Okay, that's the second the second one. The Hebrew word is also used in vo this same Hebrew word is also used in war descriptions of prisoners captured in battle whereas they would strip them naked not for humiliation only but for weakness and vulnerability because when, when when you've been stripped not only of your armor but you've been stripped of your clothing you you, you feel so humiliated you don't want to fight you, you're, you're pretty much your your fighting spirit has left you 
And that's the reason why in battle they would do that years ago. They would strip them of their armor and their clothing. Um, men, even strong warriors stripped of armor and clothing, has a tendency to be greatly weak in their aggressiveness through humility. In like manner, if we fail to put on the whole armor of God, especially in a crisis, Satan and the world will take a swift opportunity to pounce on us. I need to put on the whole armor of God. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. See, the armor, you know, that's the reason why a warrior is strong. Is strong man, he's going to have a lot more confidence, aggressiveness, strength if he's got that. Not only his clothing, but his armor. He's got that on. He's ready to fight. But you take his take his uh, armor, take his sword from him. He, you know, he, he's going to be in, in in a worse situation. Um, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The third type of nakedness has to do with intentional nakedness as in intimate, the intimate sense. Marriage, basically. But it can also be the other, the other way. But um, I want to go to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 21. Uh, Leviticus 20, 21. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Okay, that word nakedness is, is another Hebrew word. But it refers to basically, you know, seduction or, you know, sexual content. Intimacy in the marital section, union, sexual union is, a, is one nakedness apart from shame. So in, in the marriage union, there, there should not be any shame in, in when there's nakedness involved with that. I know we're all adults here, so we can, <laughs> we can go here. Um, and is a design covenant by God for strength of the family unit. The covenant, the marital, is designed... It's the covenant designed by God for the strength of family union. The unit, this unit is the glue that helps hold society together. Okay, so you take away marriage is what, what, what Hollywood is trying to do. It's trying to take away marriage. And, uh, and twist marriage, make it between man and man, woman and woman, and all that. So you're, 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 the devil knows everything's going to come unglued. Because this is the glue that holds the, the society together. The breakdown of the family is the ruin of a free nation which brings rampant violence and immorality. The more you break down the family, the more you're going to have violence and immorality. It's just, it just it happens. A police state is then needed for order. Because the violence will increase, the immorality will increase to the point where... Uh, a police state is the only thing that's going to deal with it. And that's what they're trying to do to this nation right now. You're probably going to have to cut this part out because they're going to block it out. They're going to, they're going to flag us on the YouTube. <laughs> okay. My next uh, subtitle is Who Told Thee? Who Told Thee? The voice of shame does not originate from us. Nor does it come from God, but solely from Satan. And his desire is that we believe it. It is our own voice. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, and then uh, the voice came, uh, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Um, God said, who told thee? Who told you? It wasn't God. And it wasn't them. That from, the, from the question, you can see that it wasn't God. From the question, you can see it wasn't them. But it was Satan that told them. Who told thee? It was Satan. So that voice, any negative voice that you hear, any negative voice about yourself, is not from you. It's from Satan. It's from another source. I want to go to Genesis 3, 10, 11. I want to reiterate that um, but um, the end result 
that Satan desires is that we own his voice to the point of suicide. That is Satan's crowning jewel right there. Is if he can get you to own his voice, his negative voices toward you, you got to own them to the point where you commit suicide. That is his greatest goal. That's 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 where he's that's where he's going to be mostly lifted up right there. To judge ourselves to the death penalty is his crown jewel. Uh, yeah. Okay, Genesis 3, 10, 11. And he said, I heard the voice of, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? God said. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? Satan is referred to as the accuser or the slanderer is another translation. So when we think... we. We and say slanderous things aimed at ourselves. We then are participating in his evil. Do you ever call yourself a fool or a dummy? I used to hate myself deeply for a certain decision I had made. His strategy is to trick us into sin and then slander us immediately. That's what happened with, with, with Adam and Eve. He tricked them into sin and then he slandered them evenly. He said, I was afraid because I, I was naked and you know, slandered. It's like a right cross and then uppercut, boom, right, right after it. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay, my next sub subtopic is the covering. The covering. I want to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Before I go there, I'm going to go to, uh, let's go uh, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 4. This is, uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 31, 4 is where Saul had been beaten in, ba in battle. He was warring against the Philistines, and uh, he had been beaten, and his army had been beaten. And uh, he was wounded by uh Arrows. He'd been shot by several arrows and he was wounded, but he wasn't, he was still alive. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, huh? Oh, but ch chapter 31, verse 4 of First Samuel. Chapter 31, verse 4 of Samuel. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. Suicide. Okay? Um, to avoid being killed by the uncircumcised, Saul killed himself. Suicide rarely appear, rarely appear in the Hebrew scriptures, but in each of these occasions, the person committed suicide to avoid the shame of defeat, especially at the hands of a perceived inferior. Abimelech had his armor bearer kill him to avoid the shame of being killed by a woman. I don't know if you remember the story of Abimelech, but a woman threw a uh, millstone down from the top of a building in it. And it hit Abimelech in the head, and he was about to die. But he said, thrust, he told the soldier, he said, thrust me through, lest I be killed by a woman. But he was killed by a woman. Okay, Ahithophel, this is when David was, was being... Uh, <laughs> Ahithophel, shamed by the rejection of his counsel, and probably knowing David would prevail over Absalom. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Ahithophel, but he was the counselor of David. And then when, when, when Absalom tried to take the kingdom, Ahithophel went, fell to Absalom. Okay. And so, probably knowing David would prevail over Absalom, Ahithophel went home and hanged himself in 2 Samuel. Okay. As his seven-day reign as king came to an end, and he defeated Zimri. Okay, that's another guy there. But, um, but you get the point. I'm going to move on. Okay, the covering. I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. 
I want to point out um, when, when you go back to the, the first scriptures we read um, it uh, you know the Bible says forgive and you shall be forgiven right okay the first offense was not against man the first offense was against himself Adam and Eve their first offense was against themselves it wasn't against man um, and shame which is the offense against ourselves can only be resolved by God we don't have the ability to resolve our shame nor forgive our shame we don't have the ability it only comes from God okay Genesis 3.21 Unto Adam also and unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. The first bloodshed was a symbolic of Jesus' blood for our covering and our atonement. Before creation was the lamb slain in the mind of God knowing man would fall way before it took place. The animal coat was a type of covering or atonement. I'm going to go to Ezekiel chapter 16, 62. I'm going to read 63 too, but I'm going to read that from another version because it has, has some really ni nice words to it. Ezekiel 16, 62. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Then you will remember and be ashamed, and you won't open your mouth any more due to humiliation when I will have made an atonement for you for everything that you have done, declares the Lord God. I want to go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Condemnation refers to both guilt and shame. It can't be just one or the other because you see that both took place in the garden. So that condemnation, therefore, there is now no guilt or shame to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh. Which is something we can do if we want to. We can walk after the flesh. Yeah. But after the Spirit. The atoning blood of Christ covers the guilt and shame that Adam and Eve had experienced in the garden. And we can make atonement for our guilt and a covering for our shame when we obey the gospel. But just as when Israel had crossed over Jordan to the promised land and had conquered the seven major peoples and armies, there were still adversaries in the hill countries and coasts that were, not, that were to be driven out which they had failed to do. These became a grievance to them. Even so, after repentance, water bat and Holy Ghost baptism, there are most likely issues in our soul that will need to be addressed. Battles to fight, lies, lusts, fears, and shame that may, need, that be, may be deep within us. Okay? I want to go to, to Judges chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Judges chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So, this is the thing, you know, we got things that are left in us, even though the major... The major things are conquered when we get baptized. We repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost. Major battles are conquered. And you can see it, and you can see it on the looks. You can see it on the face, the countenance. Uh, Sister Kalina, can I use you? Man, what a difference in the countenance after she got the Holy Ghost. 
I mean, it's like it's like they're actually like a different person, really. Okay. My next topic, subtopic, is crisis. Crisis. In times of crisis is where our issues will manifest themselves. When the pressure is on, that's when what's deep and hidden inside will come to the surface. Crisis is the crucible that tries us. So we should not try to escape these times, but embrace them. Only with the absence of guilt, shame, and fear, like what happened in the garden, the guilt, shame, and fear, can we have peace in the midst of a crisis. So only when these things are out of us, the guilt, the shame, and the fear, when those are absent, then we can have peace in our crisis. Okay? Um, the inability to control circumstances can be a major source of stress also. Because, you know, man, I can't control this. <laughs> That's where faith comes in. We've got to trust God. You know? I want to go to Isaiah chapter 48, verses 9 through 11. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain from thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For, in my, for my own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory to an, unto another. Um, I'm going to go to another subtopic, which is naked and unashamed. Naked and unashamed. Okay? There are those folk who, through defiance of God and morality, want to be naked and unashamed. These are they that start and attend nudist beaches, nudist colonies, and such like. Because, you know, you think a small child unaware of their nakedness is a fascinating mystery, some mystification, you know? And so we, we have this, a lot of people, I mean, we don't, may not think about it, but we have this desire to be naked and unashamed. And, uh, but those that do that, they're really in rebellion against the whole deal. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're in rebellion against society and everything. God. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that the, that the devil is doing, the LGBTQ plus thing. Okay, so much shame in that. Okay, shame is, is that's Satan's major weapon. That's what he hit. That's what he hit Adam and Eve with right off the bat. Shame and guilt. Okay, so the LGBTQ plus man is loaded with shame. So whenever you buy into this LGBT thing, you're messing with it on social media, whatever. All the shame and the devil's laughing. He's laughing all the way to the bank. So it's going to take this teaching, which is, you know, I told you I was 12 hours uh, that I soaked up, but. It's going to take that to deliver them. It's, yeah, it's going to take that to deliver them. And this thing is increasing big time. You know what I'm saying? So we really need to pray about this. We need to put some prayer and fasting into this, really. You know, because uh, it's going to take a lot. I mean, we know that God can do it. We know that He can do it. Uh, where was I at? Okay. My, my, my last topic is um, faith and love. Faith and love. Guilt and shame are counterproductive to faith and love. If I'm down on myself, feeling guilty, critical, slandering, hating myself, if I believe I am unlovable or unworthy of love, how will I receive God's love? If I refuse His love, I will refuse His love. He will not force His love on me because He is a gentleman. God is a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force His love. We must receive love to be loved. We have, um, if I don't believe He loves me, how can I trust Him in faith? I want to go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 10. And then I want to go to verse 19. But 1 John 4.10 4, Herein is love, 
that we loved God, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Not that we love God, you know, it's, it's that He loved us, so we have to receive His love. Verse 19 says, we love Him because He first loved us. Because He first loved us. If I'm trusting in my performance, such as witness, fasting, prayer, study, sacrifice, to receive His love and acceptance, I'm in error. Yeah. Those things are, are legitimate things. But if I'm doing that to receive His love, I'm in error. Uh, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were yet in our sin, which I was in pretty much sin, you know, He loved me and called me out of it. Okay? My worth is not based on my work. My worth is... If I have a son that is born retarded and handicapped, will I love him less because of his non-productivity? No. I won't. He is loved because of his identity. That son is loved because of his identity. He's not loved because he don't do nothing. Guilt and shame twist truth and create a deception. I produce love when I receive it from the source. Not to, not to negate works. They have their place. When faith is energized by love, then works will come naturally. 